So welcome, Stephen. This is Stephen Sashin. He is with Zero Shoes. And he's the founder of Zero Shoes. And why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and how you even came up with this whole idea for Zero Shoes. All right, my background. Okay, so when a mommy loves a daddy very much, they get to get, do I have to go back that far? <laughs> um, when, when is singularity then? Okay. Um, so what happened for me is when I was 45, uh, this is 12 and a half years ago, I got back into sprinting after a 30 year break, not running, sprinting. I was that kid, you know, through like elementary school and junior high, most of high school that was like the fastest pe kid someone knew. Of course, in high school, once everyone became way taller than me um, and our track coach was a science teacher who didn't know anything about coaching, then that changed and I became an all-American gymnast. So I took a break from sprinting when I was 15 and didn't pick it up again until I was 45. And for those next two years, I was getting injured pretty much constantly. Like every two weeks, something was pulling or tearing or ripping or whatever it was. And one day I'm walking around the house, just like barely, you know, ambling through. And my wife says to me, um, are you having fun? I said, oh, more than you can imagine. I don't like getting injured, but I mean, this whole thing of sprinting is very compelling. After two years of nonstop injuries, a friend of mine who's a world champion runner and in Boulder where I was living, uh, that statement, you know, you could literally throw a rock and hit a world champion runner. It was, it's just nuts. But one particular one said, why don't you try running barefoot and see what you discover? And what I, it just so happened, a local barefoot running club was forming and they were having a workout that weekend. So I went and did my first barefoot run. Now, again, I'm a sprinter. So the longest I had ever run of my own volition was about a mile and I did not like it. I mean, I run the hundred indoors. I run the 60. I don't even like doing the 200. The turn is very confusing. So that first <laughs> barefoot run though was so compelling. It was so interesting to see. And I just experimented. I played with my gait to see what happens if I landed on different parts of my feet or if I ran faster with, without moving my legs faster or move my legs faster without running faster. We ran on grass and on trails and on rocks and on bridges on, you know, you name it. And it was just so transfixing that I didn't know how far we had gone or how long we had gone. And, um, and at the end of this run, somebody had a GPS watch on. And I said, how, how far was that? She goes, that was a little over 5K. It's like, what? So that was amazing to me. And, uh, and I could have kept going. It's just that we ended. But what was also interesting is that I ended up with a blister on the ball of my left foot. Now, what I've discovered is that most people, when that happens, uh, or if something like that happens, they go, oh, see, this is all nonsense, because look, I got a blister. But I had this other realization, which was A, my right foot was fine, and B, my left one leg was the one that got injured more often. So my next barefoot run, and we're getting to the end of the story, my next barefoot run a week later, I thought if I can find a way to run that doesn't hurt this gaping hole that I still have in my foot, I'm probably not doing the thing that caused that problem to begin with. So let's just give it 10 minutes, cross my fingers. If it doesn't work, you know, I'll try again in another week when I've healed a little bit. And nine minutes and 30 seconds of agony later, I'm just about to stop. And then in one stride, literally everything changed. Everything got painless, uh, was easier. My breathing relaxed. I mean, everything got better. Now, I didn't know then what happened, but I know now, and I can talk about that in a bit. But the gist is my gait had changed in a way that I wasn't putting pressure in that spot. I wasn't doing the things that were causing problems. My injuries went away. I became faster. I became a master's all-American sprinter. So I'm one of the, then one of the fastest guys over 45. Now I'm one of the guy, fastest guys over 55. Technically, for men over 55, you may be talking to the fastest Jew in the world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot of competition. And, um, uh, and so, you know, that whole experience was just so profound. I wanted to have that natural movement, that barefoot feeling, but I wanted to be able to get into restaurants without people looking at me like I'm crazy hippie. Uh, and, and so I knew about the Tarahumara Indians in Mexico who made sandals out of a scrap of used tire that they laced to their foot. And I made my version of that. And I just started sharing that with people uh, in the local barefoot running community. And then one day a guy said, if you had a website for this sandal making hobby of yours, I have a book contract. I could put you in the book. So I rush home. I pitch this brilliant opportunity to my wife who tells me that I am completely uh, out of my mind and it's a horrible idea that I shouldn't do. And I am a good husband. So I agreed and I'm a typical husband. So after she went to bed, I built a website. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and literally it just took off. 
Um, and we went from being a do-it-yourself sandal kit company to being a company that has a whole line of casual and performance shoes and sandals that are all around the same basic idea, letting your feet do what's natural, letting, your be- letting them bend and flex and move and feel the world, which is what they're designed to do. And that's what our whole product line does. And now we've helped, I don't know, a few hundred, like 400,000 people around the world discover the fun and benefits of letting your body do what it's supposed to do instead of you know, getting cramped up in some shoe that doesn't let you feel or move, et cetera, et cetera. And here we are. So years ago, right, when I first started running, I mean, it wasn't that long ago. It was maybe 10 years or something. Anyway, so I started using um, barefoot running shoes. I think they were New Balance um, shoes. And I loved them. They were my favorite, right? And I would run half marathons with them. I would always wear them. They for. I just love them, right? So then there was this whole movement away from barefoot running saying that they're really bad for your feet and, you know, cushioning became like the big thing. Can you, can you address that? Yes. So when people say that barefoot things moved away from barefoot running, it's actually not true. What happened is barefoot running got, went like this and then the big shoe companies were freaking out. So the first thing that happened is they totally freaked out and were saying, don't run barefoot. They were literally panicked that no one was ever going to buy a shoe again. Don't run barefoot. You're going to step on hyperdermic needles. You're going to get Ebola. Your mortgage rate's going to go up. Your hair's going to turn green. I mean, they were, I mean, it was unbelievable the things they were saying. That was early 2010. By the end of 2010, things like that, New Balance Minimus came out and a number of companies had minimalist shoes many of which were not even close to minimalist and were making claims that they were the same as barefoot, which was a whole other story. And we can talk about um, Harvard's Dr. Irene Davis and her research about that. But suffice it to say, then they suddenly had something to sell. So they were into it. But while their sales were doing this, they also recognized that they couldn't tell two stories. They couldn't tell a barefoot story and a cushion story in the same breath. And so they were committed to this one, not this one. So there were companies that while their sales of their minimalist products were doubling year over year, were already planning to pull out of it because they didn't want to support the idea. And that was around the time that Hoka started coming out with more maximalist stuff. Now, the cushioning thing, so anyway, what sales did for the barefoot stuff, they went up, they kind of flattened, and then they've been going up ever since. For us, they've just been going up nonstop. I mean, we've never seen any problem with with sales going up during that whole time. Now, the other thing we have to consider is that we're Americans. In Europe, this was never a conversation. It was never an issue because they have a longer history about natural movement. Birkenstock is a 250-year-old company. Um, There's so many companies that have been around for 100 years, 200 years, making shoes that are closer to what we do. So there was already this idea about natural movement that was pervasive, and they never had the objections that we had in the States. And in fact, our sales in Europe are growing faster. Our wholesale sales are growing faster than they are in the US. Um, And which has been really, really satisfying. And we're trying to figure out what to do with that. So the cushioning thing is super interesting. And the gist is this, prior to the early seventies, all shoes looked like ours. Thin soles, wider, actually they didn't always have wider toe box, but they were thin, flexible, light soles. The cushioning idea came in in the seventies. People don't know where that came from. And here's the story. Uh, Bill Bowerman from Nike had some runners who were getting Achilles tendonitis. Nike was sharing a building with some guys. They were sports podiatrists. And he said, what do we do about these guys with Achilles tendonitis? And these sports podiatrists, or maybe orthopedic podiatrists, said, well, clearly, these are people who've had shortened Achilles from wearing higher heel dress shoes. So you need to make a higher heel running shoe uh, to accommodate their shortened Achilles and put some padding in there so they could, you know, they won't get hurt when they land. Cut to the end of this story, 30 something years later, a friend of mine is sitting with one of these sports podiatrists at a track meet in Oregon. And he says, you know that your idea became the ubiquitous idea in footwear. What do you think about that? And the guy said, biggest mistake we ever made. We completely pulled it out of our butt. We had no evidence for this Achilles shortening idea, no evidence that cushioning was better. But what happened is that product, Nike was able to market that product and they sold that product. If you remember the first Nike waffle trainer, it was basically flat and low to the ground, but then they sold this higher heeled elevated padded thing. And 
uh, the footwear industry is a bunch of copycats. So if something starts to sell, everybody else has to jump on the bandwagon because they're afraid they're never going to sell anything again. So you're seeing that now with the cushion stuff, everybody suddenly has one. And the thing with cushioning is it makes sense intuitively. Like, yeah, if I'm going to be landing and that's hard on the ground, shouldn't I get something to protect me from that? Well, when you land on the ground, if you weigh, let's say 150 pounds and you're an average jogger slash slow runner, you're hitting the ground with between four and 600 pounds of force. Do you really think any amount of foam is going to protect you from that amount of force? And even if it does for a little while, it breaks down and starts becoming useless pretty quickly. Instead, you have this whole built-in spring and shock absorber mechanism in your body, your feet and your, your muscles, ligaments, and tendons in your feet and ankles and knees and hips and lower legs and thighs and back. It's all built in to handle that. It was never a problem prior to the 60s. The research that's been done on cushioning is undeniable. It shows that you hit the ground with as much force or often more force when you have cushioning, in part because you have more nerve endings in the soles of your feet than anywhere but your fingertips and your lips. So your feet are trying to feel things. They're a sense organ to tell your brain how to move your body. If your brain can't feel anything because of the cushioning, it tries to land harder to get some information. Now, the problem there is if you're landing harder and you've got all this cushioning, you're suddenly higher. So it's like being on stilts, so you're unstable. So mm -hmm. then they started building motion control by flaring out the sole. Well, when you flare out the sole, you end up hitting that outside edge and it makes your foot do crazy things like pronation. And so now you have to build in motion control on top of the, the motion control and arch support on top of the motion control. Basically everything that we think of as normal for footwear evolved out of this one little bad idea. And because it's been going on for 50 years, it's now common wisdom. We don't, you know, the big shoe companies don't have to tell you that you want cushioning. You already believe that. They already convinced you of that. They just need to tell you, here's our new great cushioning. You notice they've never said, by the way, when we said that was the best cushioning in the world before, we were completely full of it. That stuff's crap. Here's our new one. And the, the interesting proof of that is if you just look at the way they've done it, the, it's kind of like the boy who cried wolf. The shoe companies are the shoe company that cried, cu cried cushioning. The only difference is that in the boy who cried wolf story, the villagers get smart and eventually stop coming. But with the shoe story, every time they tell the same story, some new form of cushioning, everyone runs to the store and thinks that's the solution. But fundamentally, the solution is letting your body do what it's designed to do. And Irene Davis's research shows this in numerous ways, as did many other people, Isabel Sacco in Brazil, Sarah Ridge at BYU. I mean, uh, the list is really long. So, um, so the shortest answer I could have given if I was smarter is, um, and I'll say this in the most obnoxious way that I can, it's marketing bullshit. I mean, that's the bottom line. There's no evidence that it provides benefits. It's marketing bullshit. So let's talk a little bit. I mean, you, you started to talk a little bit about Achilles tendonitis. Um, there's also plantar fasciitis. There's mm -hmm. so many different issues that happen to our feet. I mean, we, we're on the road a lot. Um, how does natural shoes address that? Yeah. So if you want to find a place where they don't have those issues, go to a place where they don't have shoes. I mean, they, they, third world countries do not have podiatrists on every corner. They don't have these issues. They don't have a billion dollar orthotic business. They, I mean, it just doesn't exist. So let's talk about plantar fasciitis, um, which by the way, is often totally misdiagnosed. So most people think of um, plantar fasciitis as a, um, how do I want to describe it? Um, pardon me one second. Um, thanks. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Uh, I'm in our office because we have mail coming in and out and things getting fixed. And so that was someone who needed to get my approval to <laughs> install a new handle for a toilet. Okay. Anyway. Um, and I did it by going like that. So uh, many people misdiagnose plantar fasciitis uh, and, and the cause can often as usually and more often is tight calves. So if your calf is tight, it's pulling on your plantar fascia, the, the tendons in your foot basically from the bottom instead of some actual injury going on here. But let's talk about what can actually cause this injury. So you make a padded high heeled shoe, you're gonna land on that thing. And if you land on that heel with your foot extended out, by the time your foot comes down to the ground, it's basically flat. Now let's think about doing a bicep curl 
this is a bit of an analogy. In a bicep curl, wait, I gotta turn on my self view so I can make sure I'm in the camera. In a bicep curl, this point here is where you're weakest. Roughly about here is where you're strongest, okay? So if I put the amount of weight that you can handle here on your body here, it could rip your tendons out because you just can't handle that kind of weight. Same thing with your foot. Your plantar fascia are designed to be, you know, there's an arch in your foot. Your plantar fascia support that arch. The arch is the most stable structure that there is known to man. If you want to break an arch, you support it from the bottom. You put something on the bottom, the whole thing falls apart. If you put pressure on the top of an arch, it gets stronger actually. Same thing with your foot. So when your foot lands flat, you don't have that strong arch. You have your plantar fascia in a weak position when they need to be in a strong position because they're under the most force. So often the calf will then try to make up for that. There's research that's coming out um, that showed that if they took healthy runners and put arch support in their feet, that within 12 weeks, they lost about 10% of the muscle mass in their foot. This shouldn't be surprising. Think about what happens if you put your arm in a cast. It doesn't come out stronger, it comes out weaker. If you support a joint, it ends up weaker. When is weaker better than stronger? Hint, never. <laughs> so so the, the footwear is a direct contributor to plantar fasciitis. And what natural movement does is it just puts everything back in that proper alignment. So you're landing with your foot in a position where the arch can be supported, where the plantar fascia can do their job, where the ligaments, muscles, ligaments, and tendons can do their job of springs and shock absorbers, where you're not having to overuse your calf because you're, you, the natural gait is about lifting your foot off the ground rather than pushing your foot off the ground, which you have to do in a shoe that's stiff. You have to push and toe off, which has no benefit other than helping you get through the bad design of a shoe. So all of those things that contribute to these issues uh, become non-existent when you're using a natural gait. And to be clear, when we talk about barefoot or uh, minimalist footwear, it's really about the form, not the footwear. It just so happens that with a regular shoe, it's next to impossible to have the right form, in part because you can't feel things. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I'm gonna open this up to questions. So if you're like a heel striker or a midsole or a toe with a, a thin sole shoe, do you become more of a uh, run more on your toes? to take advantage of the shock, shock absorption or? That's basically, um, so there was a guy that I named, well, is a guy, he's not dead. There's a guy named Dr. Bill Sands. Bill was the head of biomechanics for the US Olympic Committee. I met him when he was out here at uh, Colorado Mesa University. He was basically given a million dollar human performance lab and he would evaluate runners. He'd do like an all day evaluation for $50. So a bunch of Olympians told me, you gotta go meet this guy, so I did. So when you got to Bill's lab, he would do his initial analysis by putting you on this super big treadmill. It's like five feet wide, 10 feet long. Um, it, it goes up, I don't know how fast it goes. I was the fastest runner they had on it. I hit 23 miles an hour for two strides. Um, but they also put you in like a Mission Impossible harness so that if you fall, you don't go you know, hitting the thing and flying off the back and turning into a great YouTube video, uh, which is really a shame. But um, So he'd have you run in your favorite shoes and then he'd have you run barefoot and he'd be videotaping you at 500 frames a second. And then he'd look at how your form changed barefoot to shoes. And then he'd have you try on every other shoe you had, like doing an eye test, you know, better, worse, better, worse. In 95% of the runners that he studied, uh, if they were overstriding and heel striking, that just means they're landing with their foot in front of their body on the heel. Once they took off their shoes, they stopped doing that. Most of the time, like 90, 95% of the time. And the reason why is to do that when you're barefoot hurts and you're not an idiot. So you quickly change. For the the number of people who didn't adapt, I gave them some very simple instructions, took like 30 seconds, and then they would change as well. So uh, by the way, that 500 frame a second thing is important because many times if you go to a running shoe store, assuming we ever go to them again, they'll film you on a treadmill from like the knees down at 60 frames a second or 24 frames a second, which is video uh, frame rates. And that's useless. Um, you don't get any good information until you're at least at 250 frames a second. Like at the 500 frame a second thing, Bill saw that my right foot turned out, everted just a tiny bit in the last two frames of the video. So in one 250th of a second, my foot was doing something that was causing my, some strain in my hamstring. And then we saw that and then it changed. So, but anyway, um, so most people adapt naturally. Now that said, 
That doesn't mean it happens instantly for many people. It, there's going to be a different transition time for different people based on their neurology. And what I mean by that is um, my undergraduate research uh, in cognitive psychology was on cognitive aspects of motor skill acquisition. So how you think and how you process information as you're learning a new movement skill. Some people, if I'm gonna give you the instruction to how to, be, how to run barefoot, I would say, take off your shoes, find a nice smooth, hard surface, because it's gonna give you the most feedback, um, go for a very short run, like 20 seconds, and if it hurts, do something different until you're having fun. Now, some people literally can't tell if it hurts because they haven't used their feet in so long and their brain has literally sort of shut down and stopped paying attention. So they need to spend some time just walking around barefoot just to get used to feeling again and waking up that neural pathway. Some people, they can tell if it hurts, but they have bad proprioceptive skills. You say, you know, put your arm out parallel to the ground and they're either pointing at your shoes or looking like they're at a right wing rally. Uh, an alt -right -wing rally. And so they just need video feedback to get in line with what their body's actually doing. In other words, I've had people send me videos where um, I've had someone say, hey, here's one of your sandals and the heel wore out, so you need to change the rubber. I said, well, you're just landing on your heel and applying friction there, so that's just physics. They go, no, I don't land on my heel. I go, again, physics. We can't ignore that. Send me a video. So I've had, this has happened multiple times where someone has sent me a video and I've shown them that they are in fact overstriding, reaching out with their foot, heel striking and pulling their foot back. And I've literally had people say to me after looking at the video, yeah, but I don't do that. <laughs> it's like, that's a video of you sent by you to me. So there, a, a number of people just don't have the proprioceptive skill means just knowing where your body is in space. Some people aren't great at that. So video feedback is super helpful. The third group of people, they can tell if it hurts, they have decent proprioceptive skills. They just need some cues about what to do, just to shorten the learning process. Things like um, try and land with your feet underneath your body instead of reaching out in front of you. Think about lifting your foot off the ground. Even think about lifting your foot off the ground before it touches the ground. So you have this sort of different flavor of how you're interacting with the ground. Instead of landing, you're just passing over the ground. Think about picking up your cadence just a little bit so you're moving your legs faster but not running faster, because that can help with that. Think about lifting your foot off the ground instead of pushing like instead of uh, if you stepped on a bee and it stung you, you wouldn't push in the ground to get your foot off the ground. You'd flex your hip to, and lift it off the ground. That same idea. Think about being Fred Flintstone. So your body is in front of your feet and your feet can't catch up. You know, there's all these cues that just shorten the learning process. And then there's a fourth group. These people are naturals. They figure it out really quickly. Um, and their problem is they end up having so much fun, they do too much too soon and revert to one of those other levels. So I can't tell anyone how long it's going to take to transition. But what I say is, let's go back to that arm in a cast metaphor. When your arm comes out of a cast, you have two choices. Never use it again. Keep it supported. Or you know, spend a little time building up strength and you can use it then for the rest of your life. Same thing with your feet. You have two choices. You can start now to build up something that will support you, balance and agility and mobility for the rest of your life or not. And not is something that people don't consider. And uh, we're coming up on two weeks away from the five-year anniversary of my dad dying because he was one of those guys who chose not to do anything with his feet. And over time, his balance got worse and worse. His mobility got worse and worse. He shuffled as he walked. He tripped over a little ledge in a hallway, fell down, broke his hip, and died two weeks later. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen to everyone, but I'm, but, you know, why would you want to put yourself in a situation where that's a possibility rather than being mobile and agile for as long as humanly possible? Now, would you recommend switching off in the beginning or... Um, yeah, so you want to kind of, let's see how I can do this. You kind of want to do this. <laughs> so, you know, spend, start with spending a little time in a truly minimalist shoe or sandal or barefoot, um, and then just spend, you know, more and more time as you get used to it. So backing up to my instructions, smooth, hard surface, uh, take off your shoes, go for a very short run. So like 20 seconds. And if it doesn't feel good the next day, if you feel like you're a little muscular sore, like you just worked out too hard, wait till you feel better, do 20 seconds again. Um, and when you can do that comfortably, make it 30 seconds, then 40, then 50, and just go up as much as you need. If you're running five days a week, you know, do that little bit at the beginning of your run until eventually you can replace one of those five days with a barefoot or minimalist run, and then two days, and then three days, et cetera. Um, if you're just walking, most people can make that adjustment 
pretty fast. If you're just standing, they can usually make that adjustment pretty fast. The short thing is human beings, we like to have simple instructions, but this is so individual. There's not a simple answer, but there's a better answer. And the better answer is you're learning to listen to yourself to become your own coach. Lena likes to say that our shoes and our sandals are a coach because they're giving you feedback that you can use to make the appropriate adjustments. And just you know, to, to learn how to do it on your own and understand, look, one of the suggestions I give people is try and make it worse. If you're having a pain, try to make it worse because that's gonna show you what you're doing that caused it and let you kind of figure out how to back up from there. So if you're overstriding, try to overstride more. Slow down your stride. Try to land harder. Do things just so you can understand what the parameters are for you to play with. If you've been doing things in a single pattern, it's hard to know that there's other options. So even if you pick an option that's the wrong direction, it shows you that there are options. It opens up your brain to more possibilities. And then the other thing you have to remember is that learning something new feels awkward. It feels um, wrong. It feels uncoordinated. It feels confusing. But that's not a sign of a problem. That's a sign of your brain laying down new neural pathways, breaking out of a groove and into a new space. And, and remembering that the real learning happens in that rest period after you felt awkward because you go from trying it and it feels weird to not doing anything for a few days. Then you try it again and you're somehow better. So, but then we forgot that that getting better happened while we were resting, not because of what we did per se. You know, I, I know some physical therapists um, who feel that barefoot running is not good. Why? Now, not good. Can you address that? Like, why would people think that walking barefoot in your house or? Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple of reasons. Um, so one is, again, 50 years of propaganda from footwear companies telling you this is what the, you need to do. I, I did a, I was on a panel discussion at the American College of Sports Medicine a year ago, a year and a half ago, something like that. And one of the representatives from one of the major footwear brands practically admitted that they develop new stuff just as a marketing ploy. And they practically want to have you wear a one shoe to walk into the bathroom and a different shoe to walk out of the bathroom because you're lighter now. I mean, it's crazy. Um, so the 50 years of propaganda saying you need footwear is one. If you've been wearing art support and your feet have gotten so weak they can't support you, then people are going to say, oh, well, clearly you've got a problem with your feet. The number of people who have a real problem with their feet is very, very tiny. I mean, you know it if you're like that. If all you're dealing with is arch support, and which by the way, the research shows that, that orthotics or insoles are only helpful for about 10% of the population for a short time, and no one knows which 10% or why. So the using something that's supporting or comforting or whatever is good if you're healing from something, but it's not what you should be doing all the time. Again, it's like putting your arm in a cast. Um, the other reason that people say that is many, many people have learned to make a lot of money selling those orthotics between two and 500 bucks a pair. I used to have a $500 a year orthotic habit. And I have a couple of people who are very unhappy that I no longer have that. So that's another piece of it. Again, backing up to the propaganda that's been going on for two generations, people now fundamentally believe that the rest of your body is basically good, but your feet are fucked up. Yeah. I mean, so there's this kind of, undercurrent of an idea that your feet just, you know, they don't work properly and you again need support. Again, that's just from the propaganda for the last 50 years, uh, completely baseless. Um, and then the other thing is that, <laughs> how to put this, one of the many developmental and evolutionary problems that human beings have is that once we believe something, it's really, really hard to get us to believe something else. Mm -hmm. And even more, we take conflicting information, things that would undercut our belief, and we use that to prove our belief even more. And if anybody is thinking, well, I don't do that, then that's another one of the ways that we keep doing this is that we think that we're immune to doing this, but we all do it all the time. So if you, if you walked into a store of some sort and someone told you that you need something and you believe that story, you're locked onto that story and it's very hard to get people off it. This is a bit of a tangent, but it'll make the point. So Adidas a number of years ago came out with Boost Foam, their magic new cushioning. Mm -hmm. And the way they demonstrated it was by bouncing a roughly two pound steel ball off the Boost Foam compared to the other company's foam, big air quotes. Aside from the fact that no other company ever used that foam, uh, or if they did, it was you know 50 years ago. 
you're not a two pound steel ball. You're not just falling at the rate of gravity and perfectly elastic, which means you're totally elastic is not about stretchy. It's about rebound. So a steel ball is really reboundy, but you're not a two pound steel ball. So who cares? But it was such a great visual that people went, oh my God, I need that cushioning and look how good it is. And it's really hard to talk them out of it because they now have this belief. Mm -hmm. So to let you in on a secret, um, the way I like, actually I'll say it this way. So Irene Davis uh, from Harvard does a, an event called the Science of Running Medicine. She and two other researchers uh, talk about their, their, uh, what they've discovered about what causes running injuries and how to treat them. And Irene gives this incredibly lucid step-by-step -step picture of what causes injuries and what to do about them. And, and then she mentions us and I'm right out there with my shoes. So I said to her, people should like come and storm the gates and, and like tackle me and steal all my stuff after your talk, but they don't. And why? And I said, the reason is because they believe they've made rational decisions to wear what they wear and do what they do. And you're trying to talk them out of that with more rational information. It doesn't work. So I think we have to do it differently. And the way I've been doing it lately, when people ask me what I do for a living, I go, well, let me ask you a weird question. Do your feet feel better at the end of the day than they did at the beginning of the day? And I've never met anyone who says yes, unless they're barefoot all the time or in our stuff. Um, and I go, well, why? And they go, well, I mean, my feet are problems. They go, no, I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, you're not alone. Very common issue. Secondly, um, it's not because of what you've been told. It's not because you need more arch support or pronation control or motion control or padding or any of these things, or, you know, take a look at the shoe that squeezes your toes together when that's not the shape of your foot. Um, what it is, is you're not letting your foot do their job, which is about bending, flexing, moving, and feeling. And when you don't let the foot do the job, that function tries unsuccessfully to move into your ankle, your knee, your hip, and your back. Let your feet do their job and the rest of your body can do its job. And people go, oh, or I show them an example. I have a little wooden arch. I show them, you know, that that thing's really strong until you support it. I talk about putting your arm in a cast. I occasionally talk about the research showing if you just walk around barefoot or in minimalist shoes, you get the same strengthening benefits as if you did an actual exercise program for your feet. But the biggest thing is getting them to think about their own experience and realize that while it's common, that doesn't mean it's normal. Or I'll say, remember when you were a kid and on a warm summer day, you'd run outside and you'd kick off your shoes and you'd feel the grass between your toes or the sand under your feet or the water around your ankles or just the dirt you're playing in and your parents would drag you home when it got so dark you couldn't see your hand in front of your face or the ball you're trying to kick or hit. Um, and you would just run for fun. Like if you watch kids now, they run with this crazy look on their face called smiling and they stop when they're tired and they start again when they're ready to go again. Remember doing that? Well, you can have that again now. That's what happens when you let your feet move naturally. Yeah. So my conversation is about people's own actual experience and remembering what it's like to do things naturally rather than marketing propaganda and bullshit. I mean, we say that we're trying to remind people, help them rediscover that natural movement is the obvious better healthy choice the way natural food is. Anybody have any questions for Stephen? What about coming off of an injury? So you, you, yeah. get, you get injured. It happens. Yeah, that's a good question. Right? Yeah. What, would you, yeah. what would you suggest? Can, can, I, can I say one thing? Please. Can, um, I've already kind of drunk the Kool-Aid and I'm, I'm on the, the mostly no, 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 mineral. No, 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 no. You, no, you've un know, you, you undrunk the Kool-Aid. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm mostly minimal. I like low drop shoes, minimal padding, all that sort of stuff. Um, like a year ago, I broke my foot. And then again, this March, I injured the same spot again. And right now, if I don't have good support in my yeah. shoes, my foot hurts like hell by the end of the day. Mm, yeah. And I know it's just not the right time to be trying to do something crazy with it, but um, I feel See? stuck. See, you've gotten smart. That's the important thing. So I'm not suggesting that barefoot or a truly minimal shoe is the right thing for everybody, every time in every situation. I'll use injury in a moment, but let's just start with, you know, if you're going to be playing soccer on a muddy pitch, you need something with a whole bunch of big, thick treads. As a competitive sprinter, 
um, I'm wearing spikes that are stiff and a little too pointy because that's the only thing that's available. We're coming up with our own version of that, but that's another story altogether. <laughs> um, but you know, we're redeveloping what a sprinting spike is. But for injuries, the answer is you have to be smart. You have to get over the injury. Now, there's a couple of op- there are a couple of pieces of that. There's going to be rest and recovery and healing time, um, and that'll take as long as it takes. And I don't want to be the one to remind anyone. Um, how that time gets longer and longer as we get older and older. <laughs> really annoying. I mean, things that used to heal like that. I mean, you know, my God, if I get like a paper cut four weeks later, it's still trying to work its way out. I mean, come on, I'm only 58. So it makes me crazy. <laughs> but so there's a certain part where you need just, you know, mobility and passive stuff going on, some ultrasound or various things for bones, electro stimulation and magnetic stimulation has been proven to be really effective. But the other thing you want to do is move. Uh, for almost any injury, movement is really, really important, as much as you can tolerate given the amount of recovery. So active recovery, um, think about just, you know, when people run a marathon in regular shoes, they say, well, I need a good recovery shoe. So, well, okay, if you want something good for recovery, you know, some simple sandal that's going to let your foot bend and flex and move will let you have active recovery. But then you have to ask the question, why do I need to recover? What did I do? And is there some way of not doing the thing that I need to recover from? And I can tell you the number of of ultra marathoners that I know who are in our shoes or other minimalist shoes, who at the end of a race will turn to someone else and go, anybody want to, you know, do another one of these tomorrow? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and anyone who's in regular shoes thinks they're insane. And then these guys go out and, you know, they do another run. So, so you want to combine active recovery movement with the appropriate um, sort of passive healing things that you need uh, rest basically that you need to get over things. Broken bones are, un- again, as we get older, they're annoying, tricky little bastards. I mean, I, you know, just realized, I just realized something. I broke my foot. 41 years ago, I broke my fifth metatarsal. Um, it was at gymnastics camp. Yeah, that was a really common one. Um, I was at gymnastics camp and I had a bet that I could do a standing backflip anywhere. So of course, one of the women said, well, just do it on beam. I went, oh, okay. So I did a standing backflip on beam. I made it, but then my foot landed on the beam like this and I did that. And that's mm-hmm. the motion that often breaks the fifth metatarsal. Um, in fact, when I went to the hospital, they said, um, we usually see this from women who are falling off their high heels. I went, Thanks. So, um, but every now and then, 41 years later, I still feel a little something there if the conditions are just right. So, you know, foot bones, those metatarsals are very, very fine. Here, wait, hold on. Look, these are, t- these are tiny little bones. You know, you break that one right there, which is where yours is broken, I bet. Yeah, it's down at the bottom. Uh, right here? Yeah. yeah. You know, anywhere in here, you know, this is, it, it's ripe for, for breaking. Um, there's a lot of things that are kind of pulling on that in strange directions. So it just takes a while and we're going to be constantly putting it under stress. You may, what may happen for you is it may never, it may never feel a hundred percent, but you may get confident that it's supporting you a hundred percent. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I was there uh, a year. I, I broke it a year ago in January and then I did Iron Man in October and I was fine. Um, trusted my foot um, then this year, uh, back in March, I turned it the exact same way I broke it. Yeah, it didn't go. break when I went to the, the doctor to have it checked out, um, but it hurt like hell. So I must have like pulled on the tendons really bad. Done something stressful. And then, isn't it? and then seven weeks later, I went in and it actually had rebroken. Yeah. Um, so so I think, uh, I'm like four weeks out from that, just wondering what well, the hell, you know, well, I don't four, trust my foot anymore. It's, well, it's four, four weeks, as you know, is not nearly enough time. Um, and, you know, it's an interesting thing because trust really is it. Like I noticed even when I was getting injured all the time, um, the, and I've had like, I've had little things in the last 10 years where, you know, like a little hamstring tweak or something that lasts for a couple of weeks. Um, What's so interesting to me is seeing what it takes psychologically to get back to trusting your body. And again, that's just listening. That's just really, when someone says, I got a race coming up in 10 weeks, I need to be prepared. It's like, you're going to do what you need to do and then decide if you're ready for the race. You can't outthink your body's healing. All right. Well, thank you, Stephen. And um, I don't know if you want to just show us a couple of you. <laughs> oh, that. Um, find you. Yeah, sure. Uh, here, I'll grab a couple of things. Hold on. Let's see. Um, 
Yeah. Grab these. So um, we, it's kind of hard to see, but we have casual and performance things, summer and winter friendly, fall and spring friendly as well. But I'm going to show off two shoes just for the fun of it. So, and show off just what we do. This is our HFS running shoe. It's a road running shoe. It's called the HFS. Um, some people think it stands for um, happy feet shoe or highly flexible sole um, or, or high frequency stride um, um, or that it could stand for what many people have said when they put it on, which is holy something. <laughs> um, but all of our footwear is made with this idea of letting your feet do what feet are supposed to do. So a wide toe box so your toes can spread and splay and relax. Low to the ground for balance and agility. Um, we don't elevate your heel because that messes with your posture. We don't have toe spring. We don't need it. But that also messes with your gait because you can't really use your toes properly. Again, crazy flexible in pretty much every direction that you can think of. Um, Let's see, uh, the soles are made to give you the right combination of ground feedback that your brain needs, but also the grip and traction and protection that you want. Plus, they're really durable. They have a 5,000 mile sole warranty, unlike running shoes that say you have to replace them every two, 300 miles. And they're really, really lightweight. Um, a men's nine of this shoe weighs um, like 6.4 ounces, I think. And then if you really wanna go super lightweight, here's an example, this is our Speed Force. And this is actually fun because it's based on a, on a design that's about a thousand years old. So it has one panel here, one panel here, and this toe panel actually, you can make it go all the way around and becomes the heel. Um, we've done it a little different, but you can basically sew a shoe together with three pieces in about 10 minutes. And in fact, that's what we originally did is just, we were making old shoes. I sewed this thing together and then I put one of our do-it-yourself sandal kit soles on the bottom of it and we went, oh my God, this thing's amazing. Uh, this weighs like 5.4 ounces each for a men's size nine. So it's the closest thing to barefoot that you can get as far as we can tell. And again, crazy, crazy flexible, really lightweight, all the rest. So, um, and then this is one of our sport sandals. So think like Chaco Teva Keen, but three pairs of these weigh less than a pair of those. And again, really flexible, really lightweight. It floats and designed. So people use this for everything from just paddle boarding to going down a river to climbing mountains to running ultra marathons. Um, I actually people... saw somebody at a half marathon that I was doing wearing a pair of those. Mm -hmm. and I was like, what? Yeah. Well, and what's so funny, that reaction, that what reaction is so ironic because it wasn't that long ago where that's all we wore and we just forget and it was fine. And the injury rate since the advent of modern athletic shoes has not gone down. Performance hasn't gotten better because of the shoes. Okay. Um, you know, we just have a, we have bad memories and B we think that anything new has to be better despite the evidence to the contrary, because that's what we've been sold. We've been told that over and over. We've just, I mean, everything we do has gone back in time. We're making things the way people made things for hundreds of years before the last 50. In fact, if we think about it on the time scale, we know human beings have been making footwear for about 10,000 years. Modern footwear is the last 50 years. So 99.95% of the time that we've been making footwear, it basically looked like this and like this and like this. It didn't look like some big overbuilt thing with a whole bunch of springs and shock absorbers and motion control and a flux capacitor and hamburger maker and you know popcorn machine and so so that's what we do and and uh, and for people who want to check it out we're uh, not surprisingly at zeroshoes.com um, and on social media at either slash zero shoes or at zero shoes wherever the slash or at is appropriate. Thank you so much, Stephen. This was so informative. Thank really you. It's a total it. treat. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye.